Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Denise Hollowell? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Also, don't forget to check out my Patreon and the Bella Grande Media Podcast. I'll put the links for those items in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then I'll offer my analysis. Denise Hollowell was born sometime around 1962. She was adopted and grew up in the state of Florida. She had worked as a veterinary technician, then found a job as a school teacher. Denise had been married twice and divorced twice. For one of her marriages, the wedding took place while skydiving. She exchanged vows with her husband either right before they jumped out of the plane or as they were plummeting toward the earth, which is a fitting metaphor when considering the outcome of many marriages. Denise wanted to have children, so she adopted a four-year-old named Carlos. He was from Guatemala. At some point after this, she adopted a son from Honduras as well. His name was Angel. He was two years younger than Carlos. Denise used to spend quite a bit of time at a lake house that her family owned in the town of Inverness, Florida. Eventually, she moved there full-time. She lived there with Carlos and Angel. Denise felt as though Carlos was easy to manage, they had a good relationship for a while. His academic performance was good, and he appeared to be well-adjusted. But then, at the age of 13, he started using a number of substances, including methamphetamine, ecstasy, marijuana, and cocaine. Evidently, he was already drinking alcohol at that point. He was admitted to a mental health facility and diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Carlos wasn't the only one with behavioral problems. Angel had fits of rage and was difficult to control. During an incident in 2015, 12-year-old Angel ran away. Denise called 911 as she continued to search for him. He returned a few hours later, but the police still investigated Denise. They discovered that in Angel's room, there was an air mattress on a metal frame, as well as a bucket. The door was configured so it could be bolted shut, and the windows were nailed shut. Carlos and Angel were both removed from Denise's care. Angel told social services that his mother slapped him on the face, locked him in his room, and forced him to clean the bathroom while naked. They noticed that he had bruises and scratches on him. Denise was arrested and held without being formally charged. She had to resign from her teaching job, probably because she couldn't perform the job from jail. Denise explained how Angel had an anger problem, she said she only locked Angel in his room for his own safety. The bucket was there just in case of emergency. Carlos defended his mother, saying that Angel would throw things, hurt the dogs, and was never forced to clean the bathroom without clothes on. Carlos indicated that Angel was violent toward Denise. Carlos and his mother would lock their doors at night because they were worried Angel was going to physically attack them. While in the care of a foster family, Angel was accused of violence and running away. Denise was released from jail. She gave an interview to the media and accused the police of not listening to her. She suggested that they overreacted and never heard her side of the story. Denise was able to get Carlos back, but she was advised to sign away her rights to Angel. Friends said that Denise never spoke of Angel again. Denise found a new teaching job and moved on with her life. Now alone in the house with his mother, Carlos continued to have behavioral problems. Neighbors would hear Denise and Carlos arguing with one another. Carlos was dealing drugs, he overdosed on drugs, and he ran his pickup truck into a tree. Drug-seeking customers were visiting the house at all hours of the day and night. A neighbor would later say that her cat was killed and one of her goats went missing. People believe that Carlos or one of his mysterious visitors could be responsible. I find it interesting that nobody suspected the goat. Maybe the cat owed him money or something. Denise had a camera installed on the exterior of her house and had three portable cameras inside her house to monitor who was coming in and out of the residence. In January of 2019, Carlos was expelled from school. His mother didn't find out until May of that year. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. We go to July 13, 2019. 57-year-old Denise and 17-year-old Carlos attended a funeral for one of Denise's friends. 
On the way back to the house, they stopped to pick up a pie. After arriving at home at about 3 p.m., Denise took a nap. Sometime between 3 and 6 p.m., Carlos retrieved an axe that they kept in the shed. He entered his mother's bedroom while she was sleeping and drove the axe into her head, mortally wounding her. Carlos took his mother's phone and the three portable cameras from inside the house and walked to a nearby lake. He threw the items into the water. At around the same time, just after 6 p.m., he called 911. The police responded to the house. During an interview, Carlos gave police his story. He said that his mother was alive when they arrived home at 3 p.m. He claimed that he was taking a nap when he heard the dogs barking. He went to get his mother so she could help him with the dogs. This is when he discovered that she had been attacked. Carlos made it seem as though someone must have entered the house, attacked his mother, and fled the scene. Here's what the police found during their investigation. When they arrived at the house, they found that Denise was alive, but she died shortly after this. She was never able to communicate anything to them. The external camera on the house was not functioning. The police searched the area and could not find any assailant or evidence that an intruder was responsible for the murder. They thought that maybe Angel could have been involved. He had not lived in the house for years, but his departure was made under acrimonious circumstances. As it turns out, Angel had a pretty good alibi. He was in prison for armed robbery. Carlos surrendered his phone, but the police could not find Denise's phone. They found a manual for portable cameras, but they couldn't find the cameras. They noticed that dust was missing from some of the furniture, as if an item was sitting there for a while and had been moved. There were power cords near these areas. They came to believe that the cameras must have been sitting on the furniture when the killer removed them and disposed of them. After searching the lake, the police found Denise's cell phone and three cameras. There were no useful images or videos on any of the devices, but they were able to determine that the cell phone went into the lake at 6.18 p.m. The police examined the cell phone owned by Carlos. It had tracked his movements step by step throughout the house and outside. The phone had been at the lake and connected to 911 at the same time as Denise's cell phone was thrown into the lake. Carlos was interviewed for a second time. The police told him what they found. He initially stuck to his story, but later admitted that he threw his mother's phone and the cameras into the lake. He said that he remembered grabbing the axe, but had no memory after that. Later, prosecutors would say that Carlos actually sharpened the axe in his room prior to the murder. This was a premeditated crime. Carlos was arrested and charged with murder. During his trial in 2021, his defense argued that he didn't commit first-degree murder, rather it was manslaughter. They wanted to introduce his mental health status and the family dynamics when Angel lived in the house, but both of those items were excluded by the judge. It didn't even take the jury 90 minutes to convict Carlos of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Because he was 17 when the murder was committed, his case will be reviewed by a judge in 2044, which means technically he could get out of prison at some point. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Denise Hollowell appeared to have the best intentions when she adopted Carlos and Angel. However, it doesn't appear as though she was truly prepared to deal with their misbehavior. For example, locking Angel in a room with a bucket was not a good idea. I think it's reasonable to believe that she did mistreat her sons at some point. It's clear that Denise needed help, but she just kept trying to manage the situation on her own. Item number two. In the months leading up to her murder, Denise told her neighbors that she was afraid. She indicated that Carlos was a threat. The two had been involved in physical fights. Neighbors tried to intervene, but they were unable to help. Denise was trying to be strict with Carlos to keep him from using drugs and keep him from spending time with his friends, who Denise believed were bad news. The day before the murder, she texted a friend that Carlos would not be staying in her house if he didn't stop seeing his friends. She was no longer going to support him. Here we see that Denise was both fearful and willing to enforce her rules at the same time. Perhaps she believed that being strict was actually her best move as far as safety. Like if Carlos stopped using drugs, 
he would be less dangerous. At one point, Denise even kicked Carlos out of her house, but she eventually allowed him to return. Item number three. After his conviction and sentencing, Carlos gave a jailhouse interview. He admitted that he committed the murder. He said that his relationship with his mother was good, but then she became strict and demanded money from him, like he needed to contribute to the household. He claims that on the day of the murder, Denise told him that she was disappointed in him and should have never adopted him. He went outside to do yard work with an axe, and he was contemplating what she said. His anger was building up. He then walked in the house and murdered his mother. Carlos indicated that he was satisfied with his prison sentence. This is probably one of the few areas of agreement between Carlos and the state of Florida. Judging from the artwork on his face, it appears as though Carlos is enjoying his membership in the prison tattoo club. So at least there's a part of his prison experience that he finds fulfilling. Item number four, what mental health and personality factors may be at work in this case? According to a mental health clinician for the prosecution, Carlos met 16 of the 20 criteria for psychopathy. He was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and severe substance use disorder. The clinician implied that Carlos was extremely dangerous. He was able to give people a false impression that he was cooperating and being rehabilitated. The probability that Carlos could be reformed was low. The clinician said that Carlos did not have bipolar disorder or depression and did not have symptoms of being traumatized. A clinician for the defense said that Carlos had depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. He also had characteristics of reactive attachment disorder. He was not able to secure a bond with a caregiver when he was young. The clinician said that Carlos did not reach the level of antisocial personality disorder, but he did have conduct disorder. The clinician believed that rehabilitation was possible. The judge declared that Carlos was an incorrigible offender. I think it's reasonable to believe that Carlos had antisocial personality disorder. I think it's quite revealing that even the mental health clinician for the defense was willing to diagnose conduct disorder. About one third of people with conduct disorder will eventually be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Carlos appeared to be intelligent, impulsive, manipulative, reckless, deceitful, and exceptionally dangerous. Now moving to my final thoughts. I think what happened in this case is that Denise Hollowell was simply overwhelmed by someone with pronounced psychopathic traits. I don't think she had any idea with whom she was dealing. Carlos was good at appearing polite and cooperative. He was able to manipulate Denise. She was ambivalent for that reason. She had strong feelings in both directions. On one hand, he was repeatedly committing crimes, so that made Denise upset. On the other hand, he was articulate and appeared to be remorseful. This made Denise hopeful. Perhaps Denise believed that she had let Angel down, which offered her even more motivation to succeed with Carlos. She didn't want her legacy as an adoptive mother to be recorded as a failure. Eventually, however, Denise simply had enough. She wasn't going to give Carlos any more chances. He was going to have to follow the rules, or he was going to be cut off. I think this is what led Carlos to murder. He eliminated the only person who was on his side, and he had absolutely no insight as to why he did it. Those are my thoughts on the case of Denise Hollowell. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis to be as intriguing as a homicidal goat who skips town. Thanks for watching.